uh, Senior Membership Services Coordinator at SIBSI. Um, myself and, and my team um, manage a lot of the activities of the societies, of which Sophie, the Society of Public Health Engineers, is one of them. Um, we, we have a, a good membership, but um, obviously it's something that we'd like to grow. And um, it's just we'd really like to point out that a lot, a lot of our, a lot of engineers don't necessarily understand that they can gain membership and that professional recognition, um, and um, through Sophie. So kind of apart from SIBSI, you you can also gain your Sophie qualifications and your um, professional recognition. So if if you do have any queries as to the um, amount of sort of knowledge, amount of qualifications or experience you might need, um, and we can we're happy to advise on the grade that you might be able to pursue. So um, just give us a quick call or drop us an email and um, it's sophie at sibsi.org. I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. So I'll hand over to Malcolm, who's our host proper, and um, then he'll introduce the Alumask presenters as well. So thank you. Thanks, Julian. Um, Sean, can I have control, please? Yeah, sure. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you. Um, um, so <laughs> I'm Malcolm Atherton. I'm the Sophie Regional Secretary for North. Uh, I just want to very briefly uh, let you be aware of what the Society of Public Health Engineers is all about uh, before we actually get into the presentation proper. Um, so Sophie was actually founded uh, nearly 20 years ago. We are affiliated to SIBSI. Uh, our aim is to provide a higher profile and to actually focus uh, for PH engineers within SIBSI uh, and also within the wider building services industry. Um, we hold many events, um, not just these technical evenings, but um, the pandemic aside, we actually have various trips to factories, international trips, and we also ha actually hold uh, two dinners every year, one down in London at the beginning of November and the other one up here in Manchester uh, at the beginning of May. There are a number of different regional secretaries, as you can see, um, but it's not just confined to the UK. You'll actually see that we actually have Australia, New Zealand and the UAE. As at the January of this year, so last month, we had approximately 1,100 individual members worldwide. In addition to individual members, we also have what we call industrial associate members. These are manufacturers and contractors, of which Alimask are actually one of them. And I think on that score, I will hand it over to Sean, yeah, who will take too. over. And um, we have three presenters this evening, which is Sean, Gary and Andrew. Um, the, they call calling themselves the A-team. <laughs> so, um, we shall see. <laughs> Thank you very much, Malcolm. That's OK. Um, Not a problem. <laughs> So, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is well. Um, my, my name's Sean Fowler, so I'm a, uh, I'm a specification manager for uh, Alamas Quarter Management Solutions. Um, uh, well, my colleagues, uh, myself, and uh, along with my colleagues, Andrew Lee and Gary Zumas, we're going to be uh, presenting uh, uh, this presentation to you today, which is uh, how drainage pipe work and fire safety design uh, in high-rise applications is changing. Um, like Malcolm uh, mentioned previously, we are uh, affiliated with SIBSI. We are uh, patron members of, uh, of SIBSI and we're uh, long supporters of SOFIE as well, uh, Society of Public Health Engineers. Um, so without further ado, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick on. Um, so before we get into the, uh, the nuts and bones of the presentation, uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about Alamask. Uh, hopefully you guys will have heard of us before. Um, for those of you who haven't, uh, we are part of a group uh, known as the Alamas Group. Uh, we're focused on the supply and the manufacture of premium sustainable building products and systems. 
Uh, we've got roughly 450 uh, employees in the group. Um, that's worldwide as well. Uh, and an annual turnover around 90 million pounds. Uh, the manufacturing heritage for Alamask uh, does span more than 100 years uh, for some of the businesses. Uh, Gatic, for example, uh, if anyone's heard of Gatic before, um, they've just passed their uh, centenary year of manufacture, so they've been going for just over 100 years now. Uh, we do have three divisions to the group. Uh, so we've got the water management division, which uh, myself, Andrew and Gary are representing here today. Uh, they're based in Burton Latimer in Northamptonshire. Uh, where our head office, uh, our aluminium foundry and our BBA approved powder coating facility is located. Uh, we also have two other divisions to the group, uh, building envelope group and our house building, uh, building envelope division, apologies, and our house building division. Uh, they're both uh, based up north in England, uh, St. Helens and uh, Doncaster respectively. Uh, the Alamas group brands really do spread across the whole of the building envelope though. Uh, as you can see from this next slide, we do uh, uh, we do like to uh, cover as much as the uh, building envelope as possible with our product ranges. Um, the Alamas Group, we do have a vision, and our vision is to build leading positions in specialist markets where specifiers and customers recognise the value added by our products and our services as well. So it's not just uh, uh, market leading products we want to bring to the table, it's the service as well. Uh, a little bit more on the, uh, the, the division, the Alamas Water Management Solutions Division. Um, it's the newest division to the group. It was created in uh, 2015 or founded in 2015. Although, like I mentioned previously, a lot of these brands have been going for a lot longer than that. Gatic, for example, like I said, um, it's coming up to its centenary year. Um, it off, uh, however, the brands uh, have been going for a lot longer, like I said. Uh, the five brands include a number of market leaders uh, and together we, we offer the industry a unique and comprehensive solution package that covers every aspect of water management uh, through the whole chain, uh, from where water first uh, contacts the urban environment right through to where it is discharged to a sewer or a natural water course. Uh, it is a solution that we like to refer to as uh, rain to drain. Uh, so that's a little bit about Alamas. Hopefully that's given you a little bit of the uh, of background of us um, and hopefully you've uh, uh, you recognize some of the, the brands uh, that I've mentioned previously. Uh, so for the agenda for, for today's CPD, we have split this into three sections and we do have three speakers. Uh, so myself, uh, I'll, I'll be covering the first section. Uh, my name's Sean Fowler. Uh, I'll be covering grain, uh, gravity drainage products and systems as well as gravity drainage calculations. Uh, my colleague Andrew Lee will then take over and he'll be covering uh, the drainage aspects of fire safety recommendations of BS 8579, uh, how the Hackett Report has affected British standards and high-rise design, uh, and also bespoke rainwater solutions. And then Gary will take over, uh, Gary Zumrus, uh, and then he'll cover a little bit on uh, Harma building, uh, Harma SML and BS EN 877 and then the importance of material selection as well. And then I'll take over, we'll have a, a short summary, uh, have a look at what's new, and then we'll do a, a question and answer session uh, following on from that. Uh, just whilst I've mentioned the question and answer uh, session, uh, if you if you aren't already aware, there is a, an option for a, to open a questions tab on the, it should be on the right hand side of the screen, I, I believe. Uh, if you do have any questions, pop them in there and then we'll, um, we'll answer as many as we can after the, um, uh, the presentation. If we don't get to answer all of the questions, we'll provide our contact details to Julian um, and then we'll, we'll, um, uh, we'll answer them all uh, in due course. Uh, so for section one of this uh, presentation, uh, gravity drainage uh, design and calculations, um, that I'll be covering this section. So in terms of gravity drainage outlets, uh, the two outlets that are shown on this slide are the very two, uh, the two very opposite ends of the spectrum with regards to roof outlet design. Uh, even to the untrained eye, there are significant noticeable differences that will affect the performance and life cycle of not only the outlet, but the roof structure as well. So the, uh, the standard outlet on the left hand side, uh, believe it or not, these are actually manufactured products and so-called rainwater solutions. Uh, one of its biggest drawbacks is the fact that the waterproofing will be painted uh, onto as far as the brush, uh, brush will reach within the pipe work. Um, so it doesn't really create a, a, a firm seal on the, uh, the waterproofing. So any kind of back pressure from a blockage uh, could then work its way back up the pipe work um, and then cause water ingress and damage to the building. Uh, the Harmer outlet on the right hand side, so this is a high performance outlet. Um, it's very much an engineered solution. 
uh, it's correctly sized and built in uh, to the waterproofing. So a solution like on, on the right hand side, the engineered solution, this is a long lasting solution that can provide uh, a safe application for, for draining water from a, uh, from a flat roof area. Uh, the difference is, is quite noticeable in terms of the uh, the flow rates of these outlets. As you can see the table on this um, uh, this slide uh, that we've got here. Uh, so the standard outlet on, on the left of the previous slide, uh, you can see the uh, uh, flow rates on the left hand side there. Uh, 75 mil, you got 1.04, uh, 100 mil or 4 inch, you get 1.38 and then 2.07 for a 6 inch compared to the, the high performance on the, on the right hand side, um, you get a, a, a a lot more, especially on the four inch one, the uh, so comparing 1.38 liters per second with 10.71, you're getting a lot more, um, a lot more flow from, from your outlet there. Um, so the standard outlet, the, the key drawbacks for it is that there isn't any kind of grating on there, so it can be blocked uh, very easily. Uh, there's no clamping ring, like we said, the, uh, the waterproofing is painted on and is painted on as far as the brush can reach. Um, so the, the seal is not really there. Uh, there's no sump on the outlet either, so um, uh, a key thing to remember is the point of restriction is where the pipe diameter starts. Um, so if you don't have any kind of sump, then the pipe diameter, the point of restriction, as is at uh, roof level. Um, and then also a 90 degree uh, turn for water. So water doesn't generally like turning 90 degrees, uh, it prefers turning uh, to 245 degrees if it does have to go 90. Um, this is the same in pipe work applications as well as um, uh, draining roof outlets. Uh, in comparison to this, the high performance outlets, they do have uh, an anti-vortex grating, so it, it stops the, uh, the vortex uh, forming at the top of the, uh, the pipe or the outlet position, uh, so more water can get into the pipe uh, in a shorter period of time. Uh, adjustable clamping ring uh, to fit various membrane types and thicknesses, um, and then uh, mill finish body to allow torch applied uh, membranes to seal. So uh, all, all of the outlet bodies that we produce on, on the aluminium side of things, they are all mill finish because if we were to powder coat them, the uh, the membrane would then seal to the powder coating and then eventually if the powder coating was to lift, the seal would be broken. So that's why they're mill finish. Uh, and then a deep sump, which improves the driving head of water. So uh, by having a, a, a wider weir with a 45 degree turn uh, and a deeper sump, that's what gives it the driving head of water. And that's what helps us to achieve our higher flow rates there. Uh, on the next slide. I did want to include this. Uh, this is something that I recently saw on LinkedIn. Uh, it was a post by uh, a gentleman called Christopher Armstrong, who's a, an assistant uh, building surveyor at Faithland Gould. Um, and as you can see, when surveying a building, um, one, some of these standard outlets have been uh, installed on this building. Uh, and the manufacturers of these uh, standard outlets, because of the low flow rates that they achieve, they, they try to counteract the poor design by sumping the outlet. Uh, however, as you can see, with no grating, this becomes easily blocked uh, and there's no way for the water to drain. Uh, as you can see on this one, there's just one, ten one tennis ball that had landed in there on that outlet. And I'm sure you probably saw a few more on that project as well. Moving on from this, uh, looking at the calculation side of things. So uh, when we are doing calculations on, on gravity drainage systems, there is very much one standard that you want to remember and refer to. And that is uh, BSEN 12056, part three, uh, the year 2000, gravity drainage systems inside buildings. Uh, it does cover rainwater control systems, uh, layout, mathematical calculations, uh, gutters, rainwater pipes, and then hydraulic and performance testing as well. Rainwater system design is calculated using two parameters mainly. Uh, so number one would be the rainfall intensity. Uh, this is measured in liters per second per meter squared. Uh, it's based on the worst two minutes of a rainfall event of longer duration uh, and then also 100% instantaneous runoff as well. So what, what we mean by that is all of the water, uh, all of the rainfall that lands on our catchment area, we're allowing for 100% of it to be drained away. Um, a key example of where you might find that it wouldn't have 100% instantaneous runoff would be a, a green or a brown roof, for example, that would hold a certain amount of water prior to, to releasing this. But we would, we would always allow 100% instantaneous uh, as a worst case scenario. Uh, the, uh, number two being the risk to the building. Uh, so this is based on a protection life. Uh, we'll, we'll look into that in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. Uh, and it does vary as well depending on the building use. 
So looking at the first one of those, um, rainfall intensity and rainfall. So what defines rainfall and rainfall intensity in the UK? Uh, the answer is, of course, geography. Uh, so in terms of uh, volume of rainfall, so Western aspects generally have a, a higher volume of rainfall uh, and Eastern aspects generally have a lower volume of rainfall. Um, usually, um, I'd, I'd ask if I was presenting this in person, uh, whereabouts you would uh, like to guess uh, in terms of rainfall intensity. Uh, and a lot of people always assume because Western aspects have more rainfall that they have a higher intensity of rainfall as well. Uh, however, uh, in terms of rainfall intensity, uh, Western aspects generally, uh, for, for the most part of the year, uh, do have a, low, a lower rainfall intensity and east, uh, Eastern aspects generally have a higher rainfall intensity. So. Uh, on average, um, the rainfall in, in, in the western aspects is, uh, is, is of lower intensity. They can, still can have a, a storm events and higher rainfall intensities, but on average it is, it is lower in the west, um, even, even though they do get more volume of rainfall. Uh, in terms of risk to the building, uh, so risk is based on a rainfall intensity. Uh, so we've got three three categories here that's taken from the British, uh, British standards. Uh, we do have low risk, which we would refer to as category one. Uh, this is for eaves gutters and zero falls flat roofs. Uh, so this is based on a very low rainfall intensity. Uh, medium risk, which we would tend to uh, recommend uh, and use for, uh, for flat roof uh, drainage. Uh, so this is category two. This is uh, between one in 60 and one in 80 falls. Uh, this is for internal gutters and flat roofs. Uh, so the calculations are based on a high rain, higher rainfall intensity. Uh, and then we have high risk, which is category three. Uh, again, this is one in 60 to one in 80 falls. Um, however, this, is, uh, this category is generally reserved for uh, very important buildings, generally public buildings as well, such as hospitals, uh, museums, libraries, and data centers. Uh, and the calculations are based on a very high rainfall intensity. Uh, different design uh, factors uh, are applicable to uh, the building function. Uh, so uh, something to bear in mind as well, just whilst we're, uh, we're, we're on this slide, uh, designing zero falls flat roofs to a higher rainfall intensity uh, does not provide any great level of protection, uh, as the critical issue is how fast the water can run off the roof to the outlets. Uh, with a zero falls roof, the, uh, the rainfall is going to take longer than the two minutes um, uh, that we take the uh, intensity from the British standards uh, to get to the outlets. So therefore, uh, it, you, there's no need to, uh, to calculate a zero falls to, uh, to a higher rainfall intensity or a, a longer period, sorry. Uh, so following on from this, uh, the risk is based on a protection life, uh, like we mentioned previously. Uh, in terms of protection life, uh, this is calculated by timesing the building life by the factor of safety. Uh, the building life, we've got a few examples here. So uh, a low risk building, so like an industrial, like metal shed kind of uh, construction, uh, they're generally around the 25 years for a building life. Uh, normal buildings is generally around 60 years. Uh, and then public buildings or important buildings are generally around 100 years. Uh, and in terms of the factor of safety examples, uh, so category two would be a, a low to normal risk, uh, and uh, that is a times of 1.5 on the uh, uh, the uh, building life. Uh, in in terms of the category three, though, this shows you the jump between category two and three. This is a of a higher risk, uh, and it goes from a times 1.5 to a times 4.5. So you can see the jump there. Um, just a quick note as well: um, climate change. So. The Environment Agency may ask for an allowance, uh, for example, 20% uh, to accommodate future changes in weather patterns. Uh, however, this is not a requirement within the standard. Uh, so just whilst we're talking about calculations, you just want to uh, give a, a rough example calculation uh, for a high rise application in London. Uh, so our building life, uh, because it is uh, residential, would be a normal um, uh, building life, a uh, normal building of 60 years. Uh, the factor of safety, so it's a flat roof design, uh, it's not a uh, tremendously important building, so it'd be a, a normal category two factor of safety. So protection life would be 60 times the factor of safety, which is 1.5. Uh, so that gives a, a 90 year protection life. Um, in terms of flat roof area, uh, so for this example, we're just going to do uh, 50 meters by 40 meters. So that gives 2000 meters squared. Uh, being based in London, uh, that will give us a rainfall intensity of 0 0.066 based on category two. Um, and that comes from the, uh, the British standard again, 12056. Um, so this means rainfall generated per second 
uh, would be 132 litres per second. Uh, so a rainfall generated from two minutes storm uh, based on that litres per second would be 16 metres cubed. Uh, now 16 metres cubed of water is equivalent in size roughly to about a transit van. Uh, however, each metre cubed of water weighs one tonne. So that's uh, 16 tonnes of, of, uh, of water falling on that roof within two minutes. Uh, so therefore calculating the correct number and size of outlets is very important and why specifying the correct outlet is equally as important. So based on that uh, example calculation that we've just given there um, and referring back to the uh, the outlets that we, uh, we mentioned previously, so uh, the number of standard outlets that would be required um, based on that example calculation um, with the required flow rate of 132 litres per second um, would be 96, with each outlet giving you 1.38 litres per second. Uh, bearing in mind, coming back to the high performance outlets uh, with the flow rate of 10.71 based on the 4 inch uh, versions, uh, that number of 96 drops down to 13 number outlets. So high performance outlets are up to seven times more efficient, as well as being uh, a, a lot safer for the, for the building construction as well. Um, so uh, just a, a small conclusion for my section before I pass you on to my colleague Andrew Lee. So uh, by, by specifying and using high performance anti-vortex gravity outlets, it's not only a much safer option than using standard outlets, there is also an overall cost saving from the knock-on effects uh, as less of all the following is required. So by having less rainwater outlets that are required, uh, you'll have less uh, unnecessary roof penetrations, uh, so any areas that are potential to leakages. Uh, and it, the knock-on effect from that also is the, uh, the less excessive internal pipe work is required, uh, which in turn, obviously the, the outlet is a, is a cost, but more, more of the cost is the, uh, the internal pipe work in terms of labour and material costs. So by having less outlets, you have less labour and material, uh, and this will give you an overall cost saving. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm now going to pass you on to my uh, colleague, Mr Andrew Lee, uh, for section two of this presentation. Uh, Andrew? Hello everybody. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm getting an echo on my... Uh, I'll plug on. Yeah, um, do you want to... Uh, let's just have a look. Is, is Julian still there? Yeah, let, maybe Sean. Sean, can you unmute yourself? Because that might cause the echo. Can you mute yourself, sorry? Hello. Is that muted anybody... there, sorry? Okay. I have no echo. Let's start again. Hello everyone. My name is Andrew Lee and I'll be talking to you about a new British standard, BS 8579 2020, Guide to the Design of Balconies and Terraces. Uh, we start with weathering and hydraulic design and then follow with how the Hackett Report is influencing British standards and high-rise design. This will then move us on to the building regulations approved document B, and then we come back to BS 8579-2020, looking at performance in fire. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. The new standard BS 8579-2020, uh, named Guide to Design of Balconies and Terraces, was issued last September and covers a very wide range of design subjects. Much of the content will influence architectural design and insured risk consideration, for example, compliances that meet NHBC requirements. Most significantly, it provides focus on fire safety in a complementary context with approved document B of the building regulations. Next slide, please. OK, I've got that slide. The new standard addresses many unanswered questions about good design practice. So today we will start with aspects of section 15, weathering and hydraulic design, and then move on to section 12, performance in fire. 
So in this slide, we can see that, and please look carefully at the little sketches there, uh, we can see that figure A has no rainwater outlet and is an unmanaged edge discharge, whilst figures B, C and D are contained catchments necessitating a rainwater outlet. Now, figure B shows a rainwater outlet plus overflow outlet and a warning pipe arrangement, whilst figure C has a closed edge overflow. And in figure D, this has an open edge overflow. Now, in all instances, water staining to facades should be taken into consideration. So, what have you noticed about overflows? Well, I should tell you. Yes, that's quite right. None of the illustrations show an overflow discharging directly onto a balcony below. This is no longer acceptable design. Next slide, please. Now, the previous slide focused on overflow design. This slide looks at drainage. Here, figures A, B and C show different design options for sloped edge drainage with falls. I'm trying to say that very carefully. Whilst figure D, figure D is without falls and uses a rainwater outlet and an overflow pipe arrangement. Now, the balconies in figures A, B and D are all seen using a pedestrian surface, whether sloped or otherwise. Edge discharge, shown in figures A, B and C, are pipeless or unmanaged drainage designs and can be prone to wind-driven wall saturation and staining, whereas figure D is a fully managed drainage arrangement. Nevertheless, the standard defines all as controlled forms of drainage. Next slide, please. In our experience, balconies and terraces have always been contained and managed with a rainwater outlet and overflow. So let's look closer at edge drainage as an option. The obvious design benefit is the elimination of rainwater outlets and rainwater pipes altogether. The obvious design negative is what the drainage drops onto. Consider for a moment stacked external balconies and the ground floor areas below them. Furthermore, every story will contribute free drainage and one wonders how it will manifest at the lowest balcony position. And one further consideration, nothing will prevent edge drainage from blowing back onto lower level balconies. Next slide, please. In this slide, we can see a good example of water damage and staining as a likely consequence of a blocked rainwater outlet. This has been made all the worse by a failed overflow provision, either blocked or not provided at all. Now, those of you with a critical eye for construction may be left wondering about the alignment of the brick courses. However, I guess that's a different matter altogether. Um, let's have the next slide, please. When assessing volume of rainfall, BSEN 12056 Part 3 2000 states that gutter and rainwater pipes may be omitted from a roof at any height 
providing it has an area not, ex not exceeding six square meters and no other area is draining onto it. This has given rise to the practice of dividing extensive balconies and terraces into sections of less than six square meters to achieve the same effect. Whether this is acceptable practice or not is a moot point. However, much can depend on the design of privacy screening. For example, whether it integrates to the waterproofing surface on the deck or not. Therefore, knowing the true catchment area is essential. Next slide, please. The standard requires an assessment of actual rainfall catchment. For example, sheltering effects and the effects of guarding or screening. For a top level balcony, take the plan area plus 50% of exposed wall area above guarding. For lower level balconies, take 50% of wall above guarding and 50% of wall surface above any solid garden, guarding in one of the two projecting edges. Phew, complicated, isn't it? Especially if guarding or screening is not solid. Effectively, the drainage design needs to take into consideration every architectural characteristic of the balconies, as well as additionally, the orientation of the building for driven weather conditions, stacking, offset stacking, inset and projecting balcony design, and who is responsible for determining this information, especially design and build contracts. Next slide, please. The Isometric illustration we are looking at here shows a time proven balcony drainage solution. Drainage can be taken either directly over the pedestrian surface or through open jointed pedestrian surfaces to a collecting surface below. Here catchment water is collected and directed via gutters and or outlets to pipes in the building drainage system. Lightweight metal balconies, typically bolt-ons, are a popular architectural choice as these types of balcony avoid the cost and complexity of cantilever deck construction. Next slide, please. This architectural section is significant because not only does it show the correct architectural detailing for rainwater outlet, decking and threshold height, it shows something else. A rainwater pipe within a closed soffit. No longer is it acceptable to root plastic pipework within a soffit void. However, this is not a design barrier when metal pipes are used. Metal pipe alternatives in cast iron, aluminium or stainless steel should be considered. The standard states that balconies should be constructed with materials achieving class A1, A2, S1, D0, all in accordance with BSEN 13501. For minor components such as seals, gaskets, fixings, membranes, laminated glass and thermal breaks, these could be exempt from this recommendation subject to assessment. Next slide, please. Hackett and building a safer future. The Grenfell disaster on the 14th of June 2017 has led to the commissioning of the Hackett report. The Building a Safer Future report has identified that there have been endemic failings in the implementation of building regulations and fire safety requirements. 
Amongst other findings, the report has identified the risks posed by building story height and the need for a structure of responsibility through design and procurement. However, being a report, it does not set out to provide a solution. Next slide, please. The Building a Safer Future report identifies the need for a structure of responsibility that collectively addresses the need for a joint competence that brings together building standards, fire and rescue, as well as health and safety. Fundamental to this are the many processes involved in design, procurement, construction, and maintenance. Next slide, please. Just a second, please. We have a slide jump. Okay. Building a safer future reports that the likelihood of fire is greater in built in purpose built blocks of flats of 10 stories or more than it is in those with fewer stories. And the potential rate of fatalities is also greater in such buildings. Furthermore, the report also identifies multi occupancy buildings less than 10 stories. Strong measures are now being implemented, as we will see in the next slide. The regulators are coming. Yes, an industry news release on the 20th of January last month. Just take a moment to glance through the key points because the future is here. New regulatory reforms have resulted in a draft building safety bill, July 2020, and a new building safety regulator up and running in shadow form with the health and safety executive. It has certainly come to this with interpretation of the fire safety requirements in the construction and cladding industry. And let's not forget the negative equity dilemma being suffered by private property occupiers with non-compliant exterior claddings. The government has appointed a regulator with powers of enforcement to ensure the safety benefit of all. Industry must revisit product design in application and adapt if it is not already doing so. Next slide, please. The building regulations. Building regulation B2. The 14th of June 2017 is the date of the Grenfell Tower fire. Two key points in requirement B2 of the building regulations part B address internal fire spread for linings. Approved document B existed in 2010 and is available in 2019 edition, incorporating 2020 amendments. The recommendations made in Building a Safer Future can be seen rooted in the many pages of approved document B here, and in the next two slides, establishing the responsibilities for procuring, designing, constructing, and maintaining buildings. Next slide, please. Approved document B sets out to fulfill the recommendations in the Hackett report. Four key points in requirement B3 address internal fire spread for structure. Each of the points one to four are a subset of construction design, material performance, and control of fire, spread, and smoke. 
Next slide, please. As building services engineers, you will be aware of the significance of requirement B4, as well as regulation seven. The two key points in requirement B4 address external fire spread for roof and wall, whilst regulation seven establishes material performance fire classification. Notably, these fire performance classifications are A1, A2S1 and D0. Cast iron and aluminium metals meet class A1, although when painted are reclassified A2. Both A1 and A2 satisfy these fire performance requirements. Next slide, please. Coming back to BS 8579 2020, this is very much an adjunct to the building regulations 2020 mentioned in the preceding slides. Section 12.1, performance in fire, specifically mentions component materials, how they should be used, their risk and behavior in fire. For example, components should neither be composed of materials nor provide a medium for spread of fire. Not propagate fire downwards by falling brands of flaming or molten droplets or debris. Minimize structural instability or detachment. And fire compartmentalization of enclosed balconies from adjacent balconies. Next slide. Section 12.2 of the new standard establishes fire performance classifications A1, A2S1, D0, and the need for balconies to achieve these classifications. Likewise, minor component exemptions are identified, for example, joint seals, couplings, fixings, and membranes. Construction and materials must separate the balcony floor from the balcony below. Furthermore, and of significance to engineer and architect, is the fire stopping of rainwater outlets and the use of metal rainwater pipes within a soffit void. Next slide, please. So we've come to the end of part two and would like to leave you to consider this last piece of information. In certain detailing conditions, Plastic pipework has generally been the material of choice for building drainage and for runs within a void space. In recognising the combustibility of plastic requiring fire protection, metal rainwater outlets and metal pipes are the compliant solution. Additionally, the ability, the ability to manufacture metal rainwater pipes and pipework <coughs> requiring angle transitions is a significant contribution towards fire safety compliance, as well as solving aspects of tricky detailing. On request, Alumask can provide their fire classifications of Alumask water management solutions products. Well, thank you very much. Mm. And now I hand over to our Gary Zumerus. <clears throat> thank you, Andrew. Right, um, good evening, everyone from the UK or around the UK and um, other time warps everywhere else. Um, let's say welcome to the uh, presentations today. Today I'll be presenting um, a short overview of cast iron SML, above and below ground drainage, EN 877, which is BBA and Kite Mark certified. Although this uh, presentation is very short um, of, of this overall uh, overview today, I look forward to presenting a more in-depth, detailed, um, technically uh, more in-depth um, presentation in, in, in the future, which I hope you'll be able to attend. Uh, as you can see from the photo, if you're into football, um, as, it's, as it states there, this is the Tottenham football ground stadium. Um, 
products used there were Harmer SML cast iron below ground drainage, Wade Linear and Gatic slot drain and a few other products as well. Another couple of examples where SML cast iron above ground was used um, is the American Embassy, Newfoundland Tower in Canary Wharf and many others there still going on. So there are so many other SML specified projects in the City of London, including one of the largest sites in Europe, which is the Nine Elms Battersea site, where we have supplied SML, Wade, Harmer and many other products as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. In this slide, I'd like to discuss acoustic attenuation. As you can see, this is an example of required decibel levels for structure borne sound in residential dwellings, which is 35 decibels, and hospitals at 29 dB. Other examples of buildings that require lower acoustics are, are libraries, schools, cinemas, lecture theatres. Example of tests in this slide based on a two-storey setup with different flow rates of both ground floor and lower storey. As you can see from the graph, the lower the flow rate, the lower decibel level. If you look at four litres per second, plastics at HDPE is way higher at 45 dB and only 11 dB with cast iron. Most HDPE plastic manufacturers will publicise only lower flow rates which is, is a distortion of how plastics react in acoustic tests. You can also obtain an enhanced lower dB levels with cast iron by installing acoustic dampeners with a rubber lined bracket. So it's evident that cast iron is the quietest system on the market due to its density and mass. By using cast iron you don't have to use insulating material wrap that is a real must for plastic pipe systems. The extra wrap used and bracketry will vastly increase, uh, increase the cost of installing plastic systems. So the, the, the cost is, uh, is, it just goes up and up and up with extra bracketry as well. There are big variances of choice in pipe work relating to mass density of material. There's a, a large difference at flow rates uh, the cast iron is obviously the, the quietest system on the market due to its density. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, this slide relates to fire. In, mo in the next two slides, it will show that cast iron is the first choice when specifying and installing pipe systems. When painted, cast iron is reclassified as A2S1 as a rated fire product, which does not need any fire collars. All bare, unpainted cast iron pipes and fittings have a rating of A1. This applies to all manufacturers in the UK and most of Europe. Plastic pipe work and fittings are fire rated E and requires fire stopping collars, just remember that. It's so important that plastic pipe work that passes through any compartment is protected by suitable fire stopping products. Next slide please. <clears throat> I'll just wait for this to go through, you'll see the notes on there. So in this, in this slide, it proves how fire spreads when plastic pipe work is installed with fire collars. You can see in the slide how the droplets, droplets pass through the pipe and ignites at the bottom. Droplin, droplets can land on bends and changes of direction from compartments above and can spread to other compartments below the fire collars before they start to work. Of course, if a fire starts in a compartment below the fire collar, it will engage when it reaches critical temperature and will close off, stopping any flame or smoke. So as you can see, not every fire starts below a fire collar and is a good reason to specify and install cast iron pipe and fittings. 
I would also like to reference the details that Andrew Lee gave in his previous slides regarding fire as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So in this slide, I would like to explain why no other pipe work material equals all the properties of cast iron. Cast iron couplings have fail safe grub screws. Once tightened, form a continuous earth. Regarding fire, cast iron is rated A2 and will not give off any toxic fumes and smoke, unlike plastic systems. As you know, the first 20 to 30 minutes in a fire is the most critical time, especially in residential situations such as hotel and all other dwellings. Fumes and smoke are normally the main causes of loss of life before flame and heat. Cast iron has limited thermal movement. Unlike plastic systems, you need extra bracketry and cast iron will not expand or retract. Cast iron is robust. It lasts the life of the building. It's a forget and for, fit and forget system and can easily be retrofitted. Unlike plastic systems, which you have to cut out and is harder to reinstall. Retrofitting plastic materials as an example, say a new kitchen, extra toilets, is very difficult, especially in uh, tight corners. If you have to use butt welding hot plates or electrofusion couplings. So as already discussed earlier, cast iron has excellent low decibel levels and plastic pipes. Uh, cast, cast iron is made from 85% scrap materials such as pressings from white goods, <clears throat> example fridges, uh, washing machines, etc. Car discs, brake, drums, etc. The list goes on. It can all go in the mix to, uh, to make uh, uh, the cast iron that comes out. Um, and once used after its life, once used after its life cycle, cast iron can be re recycled 100% making it the best sustainable material available. <clears throat> next slide, please. So in this next slide, I'd like to uh, discuss SML cast iron EN877 uh, below ground drainage, which is kite marked and BBA accredited. Cast iron pipes are used for better drainage and offer superior performance over traditional clay and plastic. As you can see from the hazards on the slides, which, in, uh, which includes uh, settlement, shear pressure and rodding damage, pipes can be laid into previous dugout material and does not need any special pea shingle or any specialised bedding material brought in. And again, as long as there aren't any uh, large objects such as bricks and rubble under the installed pipes and fittings, you can backfill with pre-dug earth. Cast iron is at no risk by using uh, high pressure cleaning or clearing equipment, unlike plastic, where it can easily be broken by the water pressure, which has become a major issue uh, a few years ago and tests uh, were going on then. Um, but as you say, as, as I've as I've just said, um, pressure uh, machines do actually uh, attack <laughs> at, high at high pressure and break the pipes. Uh, cast, cast iron is non-porous and will not draw in any contamination into the pipe. One really good example over the many years is the, the Olympic site at Stratford. Over many years, paint and chemicals had contaminated the ground and for this reason, cast iron was specified and installed with various membrane levels through the ground. So as you can see in the slide, there are very low risks when using uh, cast iron. That's really the end of my short presentation. I, I, I said it was, <laughs> mentioned it was going to be short, but there are more specific uh, technical details in future presentations that will be coming up. So I'll end this presentation now and, and um, pass it over to Sean to summarise. Thank you. Thank you for that, Gary. Um, so as Gary's just mentioned, I'm just going to do a, uh, a short summary here um, and then we'll just have a quick look at what's new and then we'll, we'll move on to any questions that anyone may have. Uh, so in summary, uh, anti-vortex rainwater outlets uh, maximise 
permitted pipe capacities and can offer an overall cost saving through reduced labour and material costs. Uh, rainwater calculations must include catchment areas for vertical surfaces and driven weather. Uh, the Hackett report identifies weaknesses and accountability in the chain of responsibilities. Uh, building control increases scrutiny over the use of combustible materials and fire safety design. And remember, the regulator is coming. Uh, BS 8579 uh, clarifies balcony and terrace overflow mm -hmm. design, as well as fire safety guidance. Uh, cast iron and aluminium metals meet class A1, although when painted are reclassified A2. Uh, both A1 and A2 meet the necessary requirements. Uh, cast iron pipework is the superior material choice above ground for acoustic and fire performance, as well as being 100% sustainable. Uh, and last but not least, cast iron below ground is the superior and more robust alternative to clayware and plastic systems. Now, looking at what's new, Andrew Lee did touch on this uh, in, in his section. Uh, but with the increased scrutiny on combustibles, um, uh, Alamask has recently come up with a uh, an extended metal pipework range as standard for our AV outlets. Uh, previously, where our standard spigoted outlets weren't um, uh, long enough uh, to pass through the uh, the slab uh, or construction, uh, we would have used a threaded version with an ABS adapter. Uh, however, we've we've come up with this extended metal spigot range uh, as this will allow a, a class A2 fire rating for this detail uh, onto, onto connecting pipework systems. Uh, we're also perfecting the design for our bespoke scupper, uh, which you can see in the bottom right hand corner. Um, this may be necessary in certain uh, applications as well. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, just a, a small acknowledgement, uh, just an expression of thanks to, to BSI. Uh, they've, uh, they've given us permission to use content from the new standard of last year, BS8579. Uh, 2020, uh, a guide to the design and balconies uh, and terraces. Um, so uh, you might be interested to know as well that Alamask was one of the several participants. Um, oh, apologies, just jumped to the slide there. Well, it was one of the several participants uh, involved in drafting of the BS8579. Uh, thank you for all, uh, everyone for attending uh, the webinar. I hope you found it useful. Uh, wherever you are, stay safe and stay well. Um, and now we will uh, we'll jump on uh, over to the uh, the questions tab and try and uh, answer a few of these questions for you uh, as many as we can uh, within the time limit. Sure.